So our first speaker is Andy Mason. Andy joined D-Wave in 2014 as our European sales director based in the UK, and he leads our business across Europe, where there are now many customers across a diverse range of industries. Prior to joining D-Wave, Andy spent eight years with Cray in the supercomputing business, where he formed partnerships that include UK government, weather forecasters, as well as UK universities and major research laboratories. Andy has also held marketing and technical roles in the telecommunications industry at Nortel, Newbridge Networks, and Gandalf Digital Systems. Our second speaker is Roberto Di Simone. He is Senior Manager of Strategic Innovation and Disruptive Technologies at BAE Systems Applied Intelligence. Roberto has over 30 years of experience in artificial intelligence and informatics, especially for command, control, and intelligence systems, and more recently for the commercialization of quantum technology. Roberto has a PhD in artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh. So with that, um, we're going to get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Andy Mason, our first speaker. Fantastic, thanks very much indeed, Susan. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, various uh, applications that uh, are running. I don't think I'm doing my share system, is that better? Perfect. Okay, so uh, the, today's uh, agenda basically is going to look at uh, basically an overview of where we sit from an application point of view. Then I'm going to go through some customer applications and finally um, finish off with some, some of our customers who are actually looking at putting applications into production in, uh, in 2019. I, uh, they're, they're, I'm going to uh, go fairly quickly through uh, a lot of applications. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the chat lines and the question and answers are there for people to ask questions. And um, the, I'm trying to give a flavor here of the diversity of the, uh, the early applications that we're looking at, rather than diving into anything too deep. And at the end of the uh, end of the presentation, there are links to follow um, to be able to find out more details about them. Um, so the basically the so looking at the uh, an overview, we have about 150 uh, uh, early applications that have been that they've actually been created by customers, D-Wave customers, not necessarily D-Wave ourselves. And you'll see from this presentation that uh, I'm actually going to show their slides from the presentations that they've put together. And they are roughly in the proportions we can see here, 50% in optimization. But the surprising thing when D-Wave first started out was the idea that the, 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 the thought was that they, the majority would be in optimization and uh, that the machine wasn't actually, the system wasn't going to be uh, as useful for other things. But as we'll be pointing out today, the diversity ranges through uh, artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning, um, and, a, and a whole bunch of other applications uh, that you'll see. So um, these are our customers who have installed systems. So you can see here that we have uh, four major customers. And uh, roughly speaking, they're looking into the similar sort of diverse applications um, that range from the optimization uh, through the machine learning and into new areas of material uh, uh, science. Then, of course, we have a lot of cloud customers, and uh, some of them are using our Leap uh, services. Others have a longer term relationship with us and are using uh, remote access. But they uh, basically cover around the world through Europe, Japan, Australasia, um, and practically uh, everywhere in, in, the, in the world where uh, people are interested in quantum applications and computing in general. Uh, so I'm now gonna dive into those particular customer uh, applications. And the first one, and probably the sort of the start of the story is uh, Volkswagen. It's their data lab in Munich. And effectively, they uh, look into uh, the mobility type solutions for various vehicles um, within the, uh, the VW range. The, the, the objective here, of course, is the fact that they will then put uh, a lot of these sort of solutions, whether it's uh, traffic routing or um, design of the vehicles themselves, uh, these will obviously be part of the vehicles in the future. 
So when they started, they were looking at the idea of, was there something that we could really do that we could tell our, uh, our grandmothers about? And it was understandable to everybody that we were doing something with a quantum computer. And effectively, they found uh, a, a data set of something like 10,000 uh, taxis that were in the Beijing area. And you can see the heat map from the GPS coordinates they had uh, here on the slide. And um, you can see that there was a lot of congestion within the area. So they asked us whether we could look at those 10,000 taxis and actually be able to reroute them as an exercise to see whether it was possible to improve the congestion within Beijing. Uh, as it turns out, 10,000 taxis is uh, quite a large number for D-Wave to be able to uh, handle with only 2,000 qubits. And so we broke this down into uh, an area going from the, uh, the airport, which is the top right-hand side of the left-hand map, uh, and the taxis driving from the, uh, the airport down to downtown. And the map on the left shows the congestion that was existing at the time. And then we then crunch that through a, uh, a process, a flow process that involved traditional and classical computers and ended up with the, uh, the alternate routes on the right hand side of the map, uh, obviously demonstrating that it was possible to use a quantum computer to do traffic routing uh, in such a diverse environment. People have then used that sort of uh, the VW traffic routing recipe or cookbook, you might say. And one of these people was Booz Allen Hamilton in North America, uh, a, uh, basically a, a de defense uh, provider. And they decided that they were going to see whether they could do a sort of similar sort of thing and route satellites around the world um, to put satellites in the right place to either do broadcasting or, uh, or uh, ph photography of the, uh, of the world. And uh, from that original uh, analysis with the satellite routing, they then actually determined that quantum annealing, the D-Wave uh, system type of quantum computing, has many real world applications from, again, vehicle, satellite rerouting, drug discovery, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So they were very pleased with that. And they came along with the, uh, the, the basically the conclusion that preliminary results on this problem using heterogeneous classical quantum solutions are very promising. So they were very pleased with what they discovered. Uh, the next people then said, well, it's OK. Yeah, you can do um, the satellite rerouting. And in fact, this is DLR, the German Space Agency. And they analyzed some satellite routing and routing airplanes across the Atlantic. And then their most recent work is shown here where they're doing flight gate assignment, uh, in fact, in the uh, Frankfurt airport. And so they looked for a quantum annealing solution to do this. Uh, and they effectively looked at planes coming into the airport, uh, uh, passengers moving from one gate to another, and working out what was going to be the optim, optimum solution for air, air, uh, aircraft arriving at the airport, as well as uh, people moving between the various gates, going to baggage claim, et cetera, et cetera. And they effectively determined that it's the actual flight gate assignment is very amenable to quantum annealing. Uh, they, could, they can take a large uh, uh, number of coefficients uh, and uh, analyze them to work out the best solutions, the optimal solution for pe people and planes moving around. Um, at this moment in time, they decided, they, they came to the conclusion that it was going to be, uh, it's going to need a larger system to be able to put this into production. But um, they were very pleased with the software they used and being able to um, uh, uh, analyze larger problems using the D-Wave Ocean tools. Um, back to autom automobile manufacturers, this is uh, some results from BMW. They are, were looking at the idea that here we see the inside or underneath of a vehicle and effectively they need robots to be able to um, put, put uh, plastic or PVC uh, welding over the welds to uh, ensure that uh, water and uh, other materials from driving across roads didn't get in and ruin the jo joints. So you can see here that they have a, 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 a combination of, they took an example of three robots, each doing a different task. 
They then determined the fact that they wanted the to work on uh, various parts for the robots not to engage with each other, of course, and have collisions. They then needed to uh, optimize the amount of um, PVC that was put onto the vehicle, as well as uh, minimize the, the routing that was taken. Uh, they did this for a number of different vehicles, uh, and you can see here in the table that uh, there are a different number of seams or different number of PVC wells that were needed to be done. And obviously there was then taken into consideration that the, uh, the actual distance that the robot arm had to move and uh, obviously put that into, uh, into the algorithm that they were going to, then going to run on the D-Wave system. Effectively, uh, they project, then produce these results here where we see the uh, simulated uh, annealing results versus uh, the quantum annealing um, and obviously lower is better. And uh, they then looked at the performance and how quickly uh, the quantum annealing could be looking at the different number of seams. And again, you can see that the uh, quantum annealing hardware at the bottom, the comment there, is still in a development phase. Um, but it was, uh, it was very, very encouraging for them to realize these results. And uh, they're now going to look at other uh, different areas of where they can actually put quantum, uh, quantum inspired solutions into other operations. Uh, moving over to Japan now and uh, into another div into industry completely differently. Uh, this is a company called Recruit. And Recruit basically uh, were looking whether or not quantum uh, computing could actually help them to um, make it much more eff effective and efficient to be able to join in the bidding process for advertisements that were either coming up onto handheld smartphones or maybe even des desktop machines. So you can see here the fact that, the, that uh, when, when we prescribe to a particular web page, uh, di different people are going to look to provide an ad advertisement for us, uh, depending upon whether they have prior history, whether or not we've had uh, prior uh, uh, inquiries about their particular products, and obviously then who's going to win in this bidding war. And uh, they discovered that the, uh, effectively the quantum computer could uh, integrate both the bidding process as well as the bud budget pacing. You don't want to spend all of your uh, advertising money in the first 10 minutes of a day. You want to spread it across or maybe choose an evening program if your products are more uh, amenable to that time of day. Um, it was very good to produce the problem as a Cubo. And uh, basically they could actually do this uh, in a, in a uh, more, op um, more optimized manner than using the, uh, the current traditional system that they'd come up with. However, the problem for them was obviously the fact that they were using a D-Wave system in Vancouver um, and the actual time delays between Japan and Canada were too much to be able to do this real time. So they are waiting until a machine is installed in, um, uh, in Japan before they actually uh, start doing this live. Moving on to another, uh, uh, another market segment, here we see uh, BT, probably well known as British Telecom um, in the UK. And uh, they were looking at telecommunications problems that might be solvable on quantum annealers. So whether it was how to lay out a network, um, job scheduling, which, uh, which Roberto will talk, tell us more about. They were part of one of the projects that, uh, that Roberto was involved with. Um, looking at things such as um, how to manage mobile networks with, uh, with cell traffic. Um, and a whole bunch of different other telecommunications uh, problems. In fact, the um, one of on our ocean tools that can be found through our Leap uh, subscription, uh, which I'll tell you about at the end of the, uh, this presentation, there is a very good example of uh, how to place different antennas, uh, some of which uh, are the similar sort of work to British Telecom. Um, they effectively were, were trialing the D-Wave um, uh, partly through the, uh, the product project of D Roberto's and uh, partly on their own. 
and uh, they effectively came to the conclusion that there were many discrete optimization problems um, from a telecommunication industry that map very well onto the D-Wave system. And since then, uh, we're just about starting up projects with Deutsche Telekom in Germany and also Telecom Italia, surprisingly, in Italy. One of the uh, one of the very interesting uh, companies that's been working uh, for quite some time on D-Wave systems is Denso. Um, they they produce car parts, and they're very interested in how quantum computing uh, will affect their particular business. So again, similar to uh, Volkswagen, they've recently been doing a study that they they premiered at the our. Uh, user meeting in Milan uh, back in March um, and they have a similar sort of uh, concept to VW um, Volkswagen uh, whilst they don't make the, the cars themselves they're very keen to be at the a forerunner in producing the sort of the interiors and the components that go into cars that will obviously allow uh, future uh, routing connectivity of, uh, of cars uh, around the world so again, uh, they, they were looking at um, how to effectively route, uh, in this instance, um, in the left-hand side to do ride sharing um, with sort of zip cars, my cars, that sort of thing. And ultimately, to be able to look at transport in general. So rather than trying to route taxis around as VW did in the very, uh, very first place, then how can we... Uh, make somebody's journey across a city that might involve multiple uh, types of transport, how can we optimize that to find the best solution for at the best time of day, taking into account all of the different um, uh, aspects of that particular journey, um, not only congestion. So effectively, they, uh, they did a lot of work on this. And uh, again, sim similar sort of uh, findings in terms of the idea of deciding that the, uh, the D-Wave system was excellent. They were using six guests in this point two and uh, some very, very good, good high quality solutions were found by the D-Wave annealing system. Um, and uh, they're looking forward to, uh, to greater uh, system size to be able to run bigger problems. Um, uh, back to the UK now, um, the, there is a company called Ocado. Ocado are the, uh, the world's uh, largest online only supermarket. They have uh, lots of dark warehouses and they have uh, robots that run around the warehouse uh, picking goods from one bin and taking it and putting it into a customer uh, basket elsewhere within the warehouse. Um, there is a link at the end of the presentation that shows these all of these robots moving around and uh, The problem is obviously that the idea that um, the robots move at quite some speed and um, They have to go from the product uh, Availability bin and take that to the the customer basket and they have to take into account the idea that there are other robots and that there are uh, uh, obviously pot products that are more popular than others and so hotspots have formed. So uh, they did some work, so they, they started off again by taking the Volkswagen uh, routing uh, algorithm and moved on from there. Um, their first uh, pass was somewhat su uh, successful but they still had problems on it. So they then uh, in, it provided more routes for the robots um, as, as routes that were available and came to uh, a, a much better solution where none of the robots collided. So again, they were very, uh, very pleased with that. Uh, they found the actual the QPU, the quantum processor unit, uh, very easy to use. And um, they're about to go into a second phase where they're going to look at some of the vehicle routing they have, as well as going to the next phase of size for these robots. So moving from optimization, we, uh, some examples now of some machine learning uh, in, in environments. Uh, this is Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee in the USA. Um, they have a, they they have their uh, they're building a building to put their D-Wave system in. 
right now it's located in uh, in our offices in Burnaby and um, they were effectively looking at uh, the comparison and uh, networks using neuromorphic and quantum computers and um, they did a large study on how these uh, different types of technology were going to uh, uh, come out in the future and they effectively came to this conclusion here that's highlighted that they believe that quantum computers uh, will be able to have a potential solution here in, uh, in complex probabilistic um, uh, distributions. Something a little bit more um, uh, understandable it was obviously face recognition. And here we're looking at Los Alamos, another customer who has a site in New Mexico. And uh, they were actually looking at how they could use the D-Wave system to do unsupervised machine learning. And uh, effectively, they were able to uh, take these images of faces, uh, produce uh, classifiers, and uh, uh, be able to uh, have some very good results um, in this type of test. Going into the health industry now, as I mentioned, I was kind of jumping around between one industry and, and another. And uh, here we can see that uh, David Sarna, um, who uh, used to be uh, at Stanford University, he left Stanford and uh, was so excited by quantum computing that he set up some uh, predictive health analytics company and started using the D-Wave. And effectively, uh, the, he was really working on the basis that, uh, that this second comment here, what if we could simultaneously detect a person's risk of hundreds of illnesses and outcomes by leveraging a huge uh, graphical medical knowledge database? So what his concept here was the idea of, of creating these uh, pentagons with pentagons, hectagons, um, with uh, various uh, analysis of people in them and be able to do comparisons and link them together in the same way that they would be linking D-Wave qubits to determine uh, what the missing pieces of information are. So you can see here that in one, in node three, we have the idea in red that something is true, but in node two, we don't know whether it's true or false. So again, by looking at these individuals and comparing the different pieces of information we know, can we actually uh, get to get from the idea that if we put our personalized input into the system, um, the arrow is a bit misleading because it's uh, a sort of like a feedback arrow rather than the flow process. But effectively, if we have personalized input, um, some of which we may know, some of which we may not, if we then run it through our predictive uh, health uh, algorithm, we then come with that, come out with the personalized output that may, may be able to suggest um, what sort of experience from a health point of view we may have in the future. And so David is now building up this um, and the, uh, what you can see in this diagram is the fact that the red uh, uh, words, the trues and falses, indicate information that was uh, pre-existing and the highlighted yellow were the areas that the D-Wave system has actually produced and the results um, with a high degree of predictability, even though it was only using 21 qubits uh, in the, the, the present algorithm that David uses. He obviously has, he can expand the algorithm to take in to more complicated um, components, uh, considering that currently he has 2000 qubits to play with. Um, right, so the QX branch or Q branch as they like to be called, um, they thought after the, uh, the, the Clinton-Trump um, fiasco in terms of the election modeling that they would like to have a look at it to see whether anything could be any correlations, better correlations could be made um, if they used a quantum computer. So effectively, the idea here was the fact that um, what actually went wrong in the traditional models and the CNN website basically said that they uh, they that CNN had the model had correctly predicted the winner of every race since uh, uh, Ronald Ronald Reagan, and it had, it had basically said that Clinton was going to win by 332 votes to 206. So what actually happened? 
And the what they, the, he discovered, uh, what Q Branch discovered, was the fact that there was various different areas where the the correlations between adjoining states and states uh, in similar type of um, statistical environments, some of the the uh, the interconnections between them were not being taken into consideration within the standard traditional model and uh, the, the quantum computer was able to identify some of these areas which it didn't actually give um, the indication that, that Trump was going to win um, by a landslide but it did show earlier than the traditional models that there was going to be a better chance of Trump winning. And so they're going now to look at uh, more of the same data and uh, into the future for future elections to see whether the quantum computer can actually be used for this type of uh, uh, this type of algorithm, this type of modeling. OK, so I'm now going to switch gears a little bit into material science. Um, and uh, the first one is a very practical case from, again, from Volkswagen. Uh, they basically came to uh, the conclusion when they started the process that um, it was gate model quantum computers that were going to uh, be the sort of device that was going to be used for material uh, simulations and material modeling. And so they wondered whether we could actually use a D-Wave machine from this uh, to do this type of uh, calculation, bearing in mind um, it is uh, more robust and um, uh, has more qubits and is, is, is more advanced from an algorithm point of view. And uh, the conclusion was that yes, they could do this and uh, they were very happy with that. And uh, they haven't actually sort of uh, shared much more information than, uh, than I show in their slides here, um, but they're going on to do more things uh, obviously related to battery research. There is another company called uh, OTI, Lumi Lumionics, and they effectively, effectively uh, investigate materials for uh, putting together screens, whether it's for Apple watches, phones, uh, cars, um, and most typically uh, OLEDs for TV screens. And uh, effectively, they're looking for different materials to be fatter, thinner, um, more, more flexible. Um, and those sort of things are, have yet to be discovered, yet to be designed. And so they're looking to see whether from a quantum computing point of view, they can actually look at, at, at new molecules to be able to do that. And the answer is that, yes, they're starting to begin to do that from the 128 to 500 qubit range that we have shown on the diagram. And they're hoping very much that um, in next future generations of D-Wave systems to come, that they will be able to hit these uh, vinyl polymer type range um, where, where they're really targeted so that they can then make use of uh, 10,000 qubits. Um, some sort of uh, uh, more uh, research type work was done to understand magnetic phases and a, uh, an 8 by 8 by 8 lattice was produced on a D-Wave processor um, on one of our machines and the, uh, this is the paper that was uh, actually uh, published in Science. Furthermore, similar sort of area, but uh, here we were looking at um, large scale um, uh, networks of, uh, of niobium, uh, the qubits that D-Wave use that were uh, introduced to, to perform um, Monte Carlo sampling um, and a new feature from a D-Wave point, point of view of reverse annealing, which was used um, to be able to uh, go back and change the parameters as, as the annealing cycle took place. Um, that work was published in Nature. Um, going on, moving on to cybersecurity. Um, this is work that NASA, one of Google's partners, uh, were looking at in terms of how could a quantum computer look at all of the uh, areas of attacks uh, around airports within local environments, um, perhaps when uh, leading, leading members of the public were moving around towns, how could that, uh, how could that be interfered with um, by, by uh, terrorists? 
and uh, effectively how could all of the systems be optimized to avoid um, uh, scenarios where um, security was breached. And basically, they were looking at uh, how well the power of the quantum computer could be uh, harnessed uh, to address those sort of challenges of many, many vehicles in an environment and uh, obviously many modes of, of communication. Um, this again goes back to Los Alamos, and uh, this is another uh, within our ocean tools. Uh, one of the examples is looking at um, uh, balanced networks and how, when that balanced is balance is reduced, we then end up with uh, hostile environments. And um, the it's a simple Romeo and Juliet example on our website in our ocean tools example that I would encourage you to look at. Um, uh, whereas here at Los Alamos, they took a much more complicated view and uh, they took some data from the Syrian uh, war uh, theater and uh, looked at how things had changed from 2013 to 2016. And uh, in 2013, there were very, it was a very uh, balanced environment, whereas the, the conflict within 2016 was quite immense between the, uh, between the various different players. And this basically, uh, they uh, were able to say that a terrorist uh, um, attack or terrorist situation is likely to happen um, as it did in 2016. Um, okay, so um, in conclusion, I think the we're all very familiar with the idea that quantum computers are not going to be available and not going to be able to do anything for another five to ten years, depending upon which sort of machine you look at, what sort of uh, technology, and who the uh, the, the soothsayer uh, is who is giving that information. So uh, I'd like to share with you a couple of um, applications where companies are thinking of actually putting things into production on a D-Wave system in 2019. Um, I have to say there is some qualification here and you can see here that the problems are uh, mainly optimization problems. They are bounded. That's to say that there are, they have a, uh, a smaller number of variables, something in the order of uh, maybe 100 to 1,000. Um, and um, the actual process they're using um, is able to be done in, a, uh, in a, an environment where the speed of the communication path between themselves and the remote D-Wave system in Vancouver is applicable to their application. So these candidates are Denso, who we've already talked about, uh, Recruit Communications and VW, all who have been using D-Wave systems for quite some time. Denso, very short slide here. Uh, again, when you have the slides, you can go and have a look at these YouTube uh, uh, videos, which show how these autonomous guided vehicles are going to be uh, deliver, deliver various parts around a factory. Um, there are only uh, tens of uh, vehicles, so it's a very good example for using this type of environment. Um, recruit, again, these are the people who are doing the advertisements. They are actually going to, they have websites for travel programs. And here they're able to uh, be able to offer people the choice of saying, OK, if you want a hotel in Tokyo, um, where do you want it? Do you need it near a river, near a museum, near a railway station? Do you want it near certain amenities like swimming pools, um, hairdressers? Um, do you need it near a, a, an Italian restaurant? And again, uh, the, the number of variables within the uh, within the problem are limited and so again they're very much uh, um, forecasting that they will be able to do this on the D-Wave system in 2019. They're also in the tests they've done they're looking at the idea shown in red here that the uh, the actual sales um, uh, conversion rate uh, on the data that they've tried out um, will increase by uh, by just under one percent um, which from a Japanese point of view is uh, is a huge shift in their actual sales and their performance so they are very uh, very pleased and very happy that they will be able to do that once it goes into production 
And lastly, um, a mobility solution. The, there is a web summit in uh, 2019 and um, the, the VW Volkswagen CIO has said the fact that um, they're going to have an application that's available to be able to predict um, the actual uh, traffic anomalies and traffic destinations and congestion around Lisbon. So on your, uh, on your uh, handheld smartphone, you're going to be able to work out where you want to go. This is going to be a combination between Volkswagen, D-Wave, Terralytics, who are providing historical data, and Orange, who are providing the, uh, the real-time location of people with their mobiles, uh, vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those we are expecting to happen in, uh, in 2019. So uh, finishing off here, effectively, I've sort of talked about a few of the more than 150 early applications that we're working on with our customers today. Um, the, uh, there are so many uh, new tools that are becoming available under the banner of the Ocean Tools from uh, D-Wave. Um, the people owning and using the machines are also creating their own tools and uh, more and more training programs and online uh, systems are being put into place uh, for people for education, learning, uh, and community. And uh, from, the, uh, from the end of March, the online uh, D-Wave system known as LEAP came, on to, came online in Europe as well, um, and of course, including the UK. And um, that, is, that allows people to have a free minute uh, per month um, and obviously get to know the system, learn and, uh, learn and um, run problems um, and ultimately uh, experience a, a D-Wave quantum computing environment um, and with the ability to buy more time into the future. Uh, this is what the, uh, your dashboard would look like when you've uh, signed up for, for D-Wave. And uh, here you can see that a user has a few minutes. Uh, they've signed on and uh, they can go from this uh, dashboard through to look at um, the different aspects of the SDK. Um, they can uh, join the, uh, the D-Wave support community um, and have access to online training. That concludes uh, the presentation from my point of view. Um, I encourage you very much to look at the, uh, the Leap quantum application environment. Um, these are the links that I was uh, uh, re referring to for various different uh, presentations and uh, videos. And with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Roberto, who I've worked with uh, over the, the last year or so, and uh, he has a very exciting project to, uh, to talk to you all about. Okay, so uh, my name's Roberto Desimone. I'm from BA Systems Applied Intelligence, and the project I'm gonna talk about is one that I did on sabbatical from BA Systems over a, a, a one-year period. In fact, Two or three years ago, while we were proposing this project, I think most of us thought that the um, quantum annealers or other quantum computers really would not be mature enough to deal with big problems for 10 or 15 years. And I think one of the things we found under this task was that's being brought forward a lot to five to 10 years and with, with various um, provisos. Um, on returning from uh, my sabbatical, uh, I'm now looking at exploring a range of quantum applications for a variety of clients, but I'm also um, uh, partly on, on secondment to Bristol University as an entrepreneur in residence to help them exploit their quantum technologies. So let's go to the next slide. The next slide highlights the project that we're involved with. You've heard a little bit about it already from Andy. Uh, you can see there that BT were part of the project, as well as two universities, University College London and University of Bristol. And then the Plantagenet Systems is the organization that I set up to run the overall project. The premise really was, are there opportunities to enhance existing planning and scheduling applications with quantum processes? And if so, when could this happen? How large a quantum processor would be required to support some of these major applications that were being hinted at in, in, in what Andy's highlighted? So the project involved two aspects, uh, technical feasibility, where we performed some experiments 
with D-Wave's Quantum Anila, this was the 2000 Q version, on job shot scheduling problems and telecoms network optimization problems. But we also explored how and where some of those gate model universal quantum algorithms might actually realize further gains on different types of planning applications. And then I noticed some of the questions people asking, so what's the economics behind this? We also did a business feasibility study to explore a number of use cases to get a feel for what's the potential size of the markets for hybrid systems that involve quantum and uh, classical processes. So if you go to the next slide, um, the project was, in, as I said, in four phases. Uh, we did a whole series of quantum engineering experiments where we reviewed a range of different AI planning and scheduling algorithms. And we looked at the process of how does one go about exploring which part of the problem is best uh, uh, amenable to quantum annealing, and then explored the process of actually mapping um, the quantum annealers onto, onto the specific problems. Um, we well, heard this term Cubo, uh, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So work package one was really looking at job shop scheduling problems in, I would say, slightly more academic way. So our, our team from University College London emphasized that piece of work. Work package two involved BT heavily. And having seen what we did in work package one, uh, some of the deep experts in BT's Applied Research Center, who are experts in optimization with today's technology, who know the kinds of different kinds of um, telecoms and optimization problem in great detail. And we actually got those guys to actually implement the problem, to actually uh, use uh, the tools that D-Wave have provided to encode the problem and embed the problem of the D-Wave processor. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. We then did in work package three, this comparison of quantum annealing versus gate model approaches. There was a quite deep theoretical analysis on what kind of improvement in terms of speed up occurs from the gate model approaches and then looked at the strengths and weaknesses of both these computing approaches on optimization problems. And then finally, the business feasibility study looked at three markets and did an overall assessment of market size projections in five to 10 years time. Okay, let's go to the next slide. In those first two work packages, um, we've mentioned this term Cubo, um, and, and if you, it, it is quite involved, and without support, it would require someone with a deep mathematical expertise to generate the Cubos and apply them to these problems. However, D-Wave had certainly provided some software that actually helps to map problems so that you can at least see what classes of optimization problems that have already been looked at might map onto your specific problem. Um, and how would you characterize it first in this, this mathematical formalism, the Cubo, and then um, how would you then take that Cubo and map it onto the D-Wave processor? And again, there are tools that D-Wave provides that will help you to see whether you can embed that problem on the current processor. And 2000 qubits sounds a lot, but it isn't a lot for decent sized problems. So D-Wave also has this other uh, piece of software called QubiSolve that helps to break down the problem so that you can look at a much larger problem and at least explore ways in which you would uh, address it with quantum annealers, if not fully making use of the quantum annealing on the entire problem. And the final bit on this slide highlights that actually, it's not best to apply quantum to the entire problem. Sometimes quantum is just not appropriate to addressing uh, the, the, the massive problems that you want quantum algorithms to apply to. So in many cases, I, would, I think many people would be advocating that we are gonna have a lot of hybrid solutions for a number of years where you actually make use of classical process to structure the problem, to maybe check the validity of some of the answers and relate them to the wider problem and use quantum annealing or quantum, other quantum computing approaches to explore the myriad of space and explore and prune some of the search for those solutions. Um, so in work package one and two experiments, as I said, we had an academic from UCL and a deep expert from BT helping to explore uh, and characterize the problems so that they can then embed them on the D-Wave processor and, and run a series of experiments. So if you go to the next slide, 
Okay, so um, one thing we confirmed, we already, I think we already knew this result beforehand, was that quantum annealing is actually much better suited to optimize scheduling problems as opposed to optimize planning problems. Planning problems are a lot more complex, much larger search space, and you need the complexity of gate model universal approaches to help you massage and manage that space. But the experiments we did perform uh, on quantum annealing for job shop scheduling, JSBs, and telecom network optimization, um, we explored all those issues about how to map onto the annealers uh, and where best to um, apply the quantum process. And the largest size problems that we could address with the D-Wave 2000Q processor, whether it was for the job shop scheduling or the telecoms, we benchmarked against existing classical um, operational research tools and techniques from Google. And it's certainly the case that the 2000Q was not going to beat existing um, classical approaches. It's just not big enough in its current form to address the scale of the problems. But it was interesting that by looking at uh, how we embedded the problem on the 2000Q processor, it was possible to um, uh, hypothesize and forecast the number of qubits that would be required to address some of those problems. And you'll see a figure there, 10 to the nine, which is an incredibly huge number, a billion physical qubits on the existing uh, D-Wave architecture would be required to address the hardest possible job shop scheduling problem. But that's with that limited connectivity on the current processor. And um, we're hearing, obviously, we'll hear more from D-Wave about increased connectivity that will address that problem even more uh, and allow us to embed larger problems. Um, for the telecoms problems, we looked at uh, one of the problems we experimented in great detail was the half duplex mesh problem. And think of it, um, if you go back sort of 10 or 15 years when 3G was being rolled out, um, we looked at uh, how many physical qubits in the current architecture would have been needed to help with some of these, uh, exploring some of the network problems uh, with rolling out 3G. And we've highlighted there, 300,000 qubits in the current architecture would have been amenable to address a national scale problem. But the interesting thing, even though we know that the D-Wave process in its current form isn't large enough to address some of these big problems, one thing we did find, and, and it was highlighted earlier on, is that annealing generates near optimum solutions really fast. And you start, you start thinking, do I absolutely need the optimum solution for the problem or is getting near optimum solutions really good from a business perspective and i'll come back to that a little bit later on and, and the answer is definitely yes so what we highlighted uh, from the experiments in, in in work package one and two was obviously improves connectivity of the processor go from each each uh, qubit connected to six to 15 and higher will really help you address much larger problems but also that um, actually some of the libraries of how Cubos are being characterized are already starting to be represented. And so you don't always need a detailed PhD in mathematics to represent some of these hard problems. And certainly the software uh, on mapping is getting better and better. So if you go to the next slide. All right, so what package three was about looking at um, universal quantum computing and its comparison to, to um, uh, what we were doing with the annealer. Um, the points made again, not all quantum algorithms are relevant for, for all aspects of optimization problems. And certainly, in, in really in most cases, you will not get exponential speed up, uh, even with a universal quantum processor for many of these problems. In most cases, it will be a quadratic speed up, mostly from Grover's rather than Shaw's algorithm. Um, and so you'll see that uh, a few key points are being highlighted there. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the next slide. And the next slide um, highlights that we did a sort of a comparison of sizes of problems. Um, and uh, on the universal gate model side, um, realistically, for the most complex gra graph coloring problems, we're going to still need of the order of a, a million logical qubits. 
and depending on how many qubits are used for, for tolerance, that could increase the number to what is quite a huge number there, 10 to the 13. And as a result, you can see that if we use it on that basis, if we take these figures realistically for dealing with the most complex graph coloring problems, it's going to be 15 to 20 years. If you're always looking for the absolute optimum and you're trying to beat the fastest computer, uh, supercomputer on the planet, you'll see there are some other figures there which I'll get to. Let's go to the annealers. The annealers are really only at this point suited to scheduling problems. We highlighted some of those figures for graph coloring uh, from the 3G end. And if you again took a really purist view, then you, it would probably be eight to 15 years before you could apply annealing to some of those huge problems. Let's now decompose that a little bit further. Um, those are uh, taking into account quite a lot of assumptions on, improved co on, on the connectivity of the processors and fault tolerance. Um, so what if the fault tolerance on the universal gate model really improved quite significantly? There's been some interesting advances. And likewise, within improved connectivity on D-Wave, I think we see there that it brings those numbers down quite significantly for decent areas of improvement. The other constraint I'd relax is, do we have to have the opt totally optimum solution? And if you relax them, look for near optimum solutions and look at, do we have to beat a supercomputer? Or should we look at a computer of the same value as some of the quantum processors in, in the sort of 10 to $15 million end? That brings the time scales down even further. So the results, and these look like sort of wet fingered guesses, but they are based on analysis that are in our final report, highlights that realistically, actually with gate model approaches, it is gonna be more like around 10 years. But with the D-Wave processor, possibly the three years might be a little bit optimistic, but certainly nearer the five-year end of the spectrum is looking an awful lot more promising for dealing with really decent-sized problems. So if we go to my next slide, which comes to the last part of the project, which was business feasibility for optimization, uh, we held a workshop with a number of companies. You'll just see a few on, on the chart there. Um, we had presentations uh, from BT and obviously from DW and Ocado that you've already heard about. And we ran a, a brainstorming session with all the people there to find out what are the potential opportunities. Based on what we've described, what are the interesting, uh, interesting problems in each of those different areas? So if you go to my next slide, this identifies some of the specific areas that came out of our brainstorming session. We widened on the team for telecoms the range of problems that we felt that annealers were actually best suited to addressing. I'm not gonna go through those in depth, but also from a distribution logistics perspective, uh, you've heard of what Ocado have been doing, Amazon are equally doing interesting problems in this area. Uh, it's not just about vehicle routing, it will be about warehousing and broader strategic and tactical logistics scheduling. You've heard a little bit about that from Denso. And this could equally support traffic flow optimization, whether it's vehicle, rail, maritime, air traffic, and again, you've heard a few of those from Andy, but also could deal with maintenance scheduling associated with distribution logistics. Our final um, use case was on a range of different interesting applications to do with the military and hospitals and power and oil and gas. I won't go through that, but you're welcome to read the report and find out more details about that. If you go to my next slide, which is a little bit more now on the business, uh, business um, and economic modeling. What we did here, we did an analysis, and if you see some of the figures that are in brackets, if you look at the telecom network optimization and see the 31.8 billion and the 46.4 billion in, in 10 years time, those figures in brackets are figures we got from accredited um, reports, whether a Gartner or Frost and Sullivan or Forrester, they identified not the quantum market, but the existing software market for telecoms network optimization, or the market for software for distribution logistics, or software for traffic flow optimization. So in brackets is our base under, upon which we wanted to explore what is the possible size of a hybrid that involves quantum market based on these figures. And you'll see just there the assumptions that we had was that for uh, the overall market size from 2021 to 2023, in a sort of like five years time approximately, 
we made an assumption that those figures in brackets, if we only took 5%, that was probably as far as we could go in the five year time. But as we go to 10 years time, we could probably look at 15% of that software market potentially being addressed by quantum solutions. And if you take that, you'll see the figures that come out. You can see the global market for hybrid quantum software solutions uh, for telecoms between 1.6 billion in five years time and 6.9 billion in 10 years time. And logit distribution logistics from about a billion to 5 billion. And the traffic flow you'll see from about 1.4 billion going up to 12.7, which sounds a bit weird. How come there's such a jump? Well, it turns out that many of those um, surveys are already factoring in uh, autonomous driving, certainly in the five to 10 year arena. And so we're seeing there's gonna be a great desire for software. And if that software is potentially quantum enabled, then you can see some of the factors that uh, uh, as, as parts of the market that be addressed. Let me go probably, I think it's my final slide. Um, uh, so it's the penultimate slide, just highlighting some of the opportunities uh, for exploiting uh, some of these opportunities in this area. Let's go past that slide to the, my final slide, which just summarizes, we performed a series of experiments. We explored um, the, the largest possible problems you could put on the D-Way 2000Q processor and use that to project how large a processor would you need to address some of the really hard problems that have been interesting to industry for job shop scheduling and telecoms. We also explored the optimized planning and scheduling area. Uh, uh, sorry, we explored universal gate models versus quantum annealing techniques. And then we did this business feasibility for optimization. Um, I think I'm going to stop there because I know we're sort of running out of time. And hopefully, maybe there'll be opportunity for people to ask some questions. So I'll probably hand back to Susan uh, to take things further forward. Thank you so much, Roberto. We do have a few minutes to answer a few questions. A lot of them have been answered during the uh, presentations. Uh, here's a good question. I think uh, Roberto, if you would answer it, and then maybe Andy can comment. For small businesses, the biggest problem with investing in quantum application development is all of the government funding goes to big companies like Lockheed and BAE. Despite 25% of government contracts being set aside for small businesses, it's virtually impossible to get a government contract R&D or otherwise unless you already have connections to one of these companies or the government. What advice do you have on how small businesses can get funding to develop applications on the quantum computer? Andy, I, I, I can sort of help here from a UK perspective, those who are UK based, there is a large UK quantum technology program and um, I help with the assessment of some of the applications for Innovate UK. Um, and there are many small, medium sized businesses that apply for grants and get them. So it isn't just for the big businesses. Certainly from a UK perspective, there is money uh, in the national program to support small businesses to apply innovative areas, uh, innovative applications. I, I would I would echo that for the rest of Europe as well, uh, Roberto. Um, there, are, it is probably from a uh, facilitating it point of view easier for SMEs and smaller businesses to actually put in the applications. Um, however, I, one caveat to that I would make would be the fact that um, the a lot of those businesses then have fewer people who are able to actually work on the projects. And sometimes that's a, uh, a perhaps a barrier to entry, uh, having the actual resource to take off the day job to be able to work on these types of projects. Okay, next question. I think Roberto answered this pretty well, but um, Andy, maybe you'd want to comment. Do most all of the applications presented here use a hybrid approach with some of the optimization being done on the D-Way annealer and some of it being done on a classical computer? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, there are some sort of, um, uh, shall we say, let, let me test the quantum computer and therefore we're going to make a program that will run on it, uh, test it out and yes it works. We're then going to develop further the algorithm but in doing so there's, there's almost, in, well in every single of the applications that I showed there was some pre-processing that happened on a traditional computer 
and then the answers that came back from the quantum computer, they were then either visualized or put into a table or formatted such that they, they made sense and could work, be used in the workflow uh, of the environment. So yes, totally agree with what Roberto said. Okay. Um, how would the examples Andy described be enhanced with Pegasus? Uh, Pegasus, we've announced it um, as our next generation technology. We will be sort of rolling out news about it um, in the future as well. Uh, but I know some people have already uh, read some of our material on it. So Andy, any thoughts? Well, I think that uh, one thing I tell everybody is the idea that, yes, we're going to jump from 2,000 to 5,000 plus qubits, and that will certainly have some sort of benefit. But uh, probably more importantly, we will be increasing the connectivity such that uh, we're able to realize uh, stronger, higher quality type of algorithms using the, uh, the qubits and the way that they are connected to each other. But also one thing that, uh, that, that I must admit is the fact that our software is developing at an incredible rate and the tools and the facilities we have available as they come online, some of which are being developed specifically for the Pegasus 5000 qubit architecture, they will have a dramatic effect as well. To be able to put your finger on things and say, ah, this traffic routing problem will be enhanced by twofold, fourfold or whatever, that's a lot harder to do because it is very uh, application or algorithm dependent. Um, but certainly a lot of benefits will be, uh, will be found in the new architecture. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. A number of people asked about getting copies of the slides. Uh, we will be posting these to our website later this week, and I will send an email out to everyone who registered uh, with a link to access those. Uh, the recording of this webinar will also be available on YouTube. Um, unfortunately, our YouTube live stream stopped uh, a couple of times, not quite sure why, but uh, if you would like to watch this again or you'd like to pass it along to people, it'll be on the D-Wave Systems uh, YouTube site. So thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to especially thank our presenters, especially Roberto for his time today, and I hope you all found value in it, and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.